Well, welcome everybody. This meeting will be recorded and posted to the OATS website and YouTube channel for the benefit of those who can't attend today. Um, and I wanna welcome you all to the Organic Advisor Call Series. I'm your host, Nate Powell Palm, the Training Specialist with OATS. This series is brought to you by the Organic Agronomy Training Service, or OATS. This is our 14th episode. Uh, please visit the OATS website to view the call schedule and the list of topics that are coming up. If you haven't done so already, I highly recommend signing up for the newly launched Organic Advisor Listserv. We'll be having some great conversations right in your inbox on all things related to advising organic grain farmers. And the link to that is going to be in the chat. And that is mostly it for housekeeping this morning. My guest today is Berkeley Walsh of Simple Mills. And I'm so excited because this is one of the neatest brands both up and coming, but also just doing great work in the space. Berkeley is an associate manager at, uh, of sustainability and mission at Simple Mills, focused on regenerative agriculture programming, supply chain tra transparency, and product design for human and planetary health. And I'll just get the questions kicked off, Berkeley. One, thank you so much for being here. Um, for everyone, Berkeley is winning the champion award today for getting up the earliest being in Hawaii right now. So we really appreciate you joining us, appreciate your time. And just getting kicked off, could you tell us how did you get into the organic food space? Definitely. Thank you for having me, Nate. Great to talk with you and everyone else. Um, so I think my story of getting into organics is a bit funny. Um, I actually grew up in Sonoma County, California, a pretty agricultural area, but focused mostly on wine and dairy. So quite different than most of the crops that I end up working on now and was lucky to go to a high school that had a lot of agriculture courses. I was in FFA as a kid, um, but thought that was kind of the ending of my uh, being in the world of agriculture. Uh, and then actually in college, uh, ended up getting to work for Annie's as an intern. And that's actually where I first uh, heard of Nate was on the back of an Annie's box of mac and cheese. Um, and there, you know, kind of learned about this whole world of you know, sustainable food companies trying to do work in this space. And luckily, I was stu a student at UC Berkeley, which has a lot of, you know, well known folks in the food world, you know, from Michael Pollan to Alice Waters. And from there, just really kind of dug in, uh, pun intended, to the world of food and the way that especially brands and, you know, companies can play a role in you know, supporting the kind of food system that we want to see in the world. Um, and, you know, from there have just followed the path of, you know, how do I get involved in creating that kind of future that I want to see um, for the food, not only that I'm eating, but, you know, that everyone around me is. Um, and, you know, have really enjoyed it since and looking forward to hopefully many more years uh, in, in food. Well, we are glad you're in food and glad you took this interest in this kind of food. Um, could you tell us a little bit about Simple Mills? Where did they come from? What did they do? I see them in all store shelves. So would love that backstory. Yeah, definitely. Um, so Simple Mills was founded uh, just about 10 years ago, actually, um, by our CEO and founder, Caitlin Smith. Um, so Simple Mills, if you're not familiar, we are a gluten-free, grain-free uh, brand. We make crackers, cookies, baking mixes, and bars. So lots of different kinds of products. Um, and, you know, when we were founded, Caitlin was actually a consultant working for a big firm, and she was traveling all the time, eating out a lot of food and not really feeling great. Um, and one of her friends suggested that maybe she should try cleaning up her diet and, you know, thinking more about what she was eating. And she ended up taking that advice and realizing, you know, just what a huge impact food has on the way we feel. And from there, she made a list actually of all the different ways she could potentially uh, have an impact on the food system and create some change. 
And from there, she actually landed on starting a food company. Um, so As thanks to that decision. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, thanks to that decision, uh, we're all here today. Um, and as part of that, she, you know, was very focused on impact food as personal health and being. Um, but over the last uh, few years, we've kind of evolved our mission and shifted our focus to also think about the planetary health impact of our food choices. Um, and Caitlin actually went to permaculture school herself, you know, really kind of immersed into this world of the environmental impact that food has. And so now, our mission has evolved to uh, focus on the holistic health of the planet and its people. So kind of including both pillars of, you know, where food is so intricately connected at, you know, this intersection of both human health, but also, of course, planetary health. And I think, you know, organics, of course, is a great example of, you know, that intersection. Um, and since then, we have made a commitment that all of our new innovation products will advance regenerative agriculture. Um, so not only, you know, upholding the human health pillars of our mission, but also thinking about, you know, what our impact is in the planetary health space. So that seems to be really where your role lies, is understanding the mm -hmm. supply chain to, to make that sourcing happen. Um, for a lot of food companies, it seems like that is a big lift, that figuring out how do we do responsible sourcing, and by responsible, mostly just transparent, that they actually know where the food or the ingredients are coming from and what impact they're having on the environment. Could you speak a little bit to how has your role and Simple Mills allowed that transparency or demanded that transparency in the supply chain? And how have farmers risen to the challenge or the opportunity? of meeting that, that request? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think a lot of folks who aren't involved in the food system um, are surprised to learn that most, you know, companies aren't in fact buying ingredients directly from a farmer. You know, that's not what the, the majority of our food system looks like today. Um, and so you are correct. Transparency is a huge piece of what I do at Simple Mills. Um, so we are lucky to know a lot of our suppliers and have a lot of those deep relationships after, you know, many years of working together. But, you know, our portfolio includes, I think we're up to 45 crops now and hundreds of specific ingredients within those kind of main crop groups. And so, you know, getting to know all the folks involved from every one of those ingredients is uh, definitely a challenge. Um, and so we actually designed, uh, we've called it our regenerative agriculture engagement tool. So it's a online kind of software built tool that allows us to learn, you know, what's happening at the farm level for, you know, hopefully the majority of the ingredients that we're using in our products. So through that, you know, one gathering a lot of information, you know, from, what is the depth of your average tillage pass to, you know, what percent of nutrients that you're applying are coming from organic sources? Um, what is the indigenous history of the land that you're on? Um, so a lot of questions that we learned when we piloted this back two years ago hadn't been asked of a lot of people before. And, you know, uh, it was the first time many folks uh, were asked that one from a brand customer or two had even thought like this would be you know the kind of data that would be requested of them um mm -hmm. and so over the past two years now kind of piloting that and expanding it to a much broader supply base um have had a lot of learnings about you know the timing the kind of information that we're gathering as part of that um but also seeing it too as you know, a kind of like two-way educational street and that we're learning a lot from, you know, farmers and folks who are filling it out and providing information to us regarding like what is what is actually relevant to, you know, their operations, what kind of information should we actually be asking for, but also, you know, for them on their side, um, you know, we've structured it around uh, our approach to Regen Ag, which is very principle focused. Um, 
and provide a lot of kind of uh, resources within it. So hopefully, you know, we're while asking for questions and answers, kind of also sharing our approach to the space and the why behind how we've structured it. Um, so it's been a quite a helpful um, exercise in, you know, increasing that visibility to understand what's happening at the farm for a lot of different systems and different crops and ingredients, um, but also, you know, having a lot of learnings on both sides. Absolutely. As a farmer, it just brings my heart joy that there is a two-way street there. I think that a lot of really well-intentioned folks get into this space, um, but then they prescribe to farmers mm -hmm. what uh, they need to be doing or what they want grown. So building on that, um, I was reading about uh, Simple Mills being recognized for sourcing biodiverse crops or increasing biodiversity on farms. And could you tell us a little bit about how you um, think of crops that you'd like to buy or hear from farmers about crops that they would like to grow and then move that to the other side of the company for R&D? How does that goal, which I think for a lot of farmers, a lot of agronomists, we recognize certain crops would be great. Like we talked about sunflowers and buckwheat last week um, and, uh, and, and thinking about how, how those would impact our rotation. Um, how do you guys then try to make that into some food that folks would buy? Yeah, that's an awesome question. Um, and one that we love, we're all about, uh, biodiversity and, you know, the kind of crops that we're trying to use. Um, so for some background, um, like I mentioned earlier, we have made this kind of public commitment that all of our products, you know, coming out since 2021, um, advanced regenerative agriculture. And there's a few different pathways through which uh, we consider, you know, a product to fulfill that commitment. One of which uh, we call design for diversity. So within that, we have a couple different ways that we um, are trying to think through how do we like build this into a product from the very beginning of its creation rather than you know, I think traditional food model is, you know, thinking like, what do the consumers want and how do we make that? And then the sustainability team tries to think, you know, how do we make that like a smaller impact? Um, but we're trying to kind of reverse that order and ensure that, you know, our sustainability strategy and our approach to agri agriculture is really included in the design from the very beginning. So, that means that we work very cross-functionally. Um, we're part of the innovation team. So working with, you know, the R&D scientists, the project managers, um, the procurement team, um, you know, a lot of different folks across the organization since we're doing this work at the very beginning of a product. Um, and so within that kind of diversity bucket, uh, there's a few ways that we look to do that. So one of which is trying to include plants from different categories that could work well in a rotation together. We definitely understand that, you know, farmers aren't just growing one thing that we might be buying, but there, there's a lot of other things that are going into that, right? So how do we support the market demand that's required for all of those different crops, not just one maybe that we're interested in um and that has been really interesting i think it's unlikely that a lot of other companies r d teams also have to understand what crop rotations look like and how you know important it is to include the different pieces of that um another kind of few ways that we look to do that is supporting perennials so perennials that have you know proven ecosystem benefits like carbon sequestration um, a great example of that that we use is chestnut. So again, trying to build, you know, the market demand for that crop. And then also forgotten foods that have, you know, significant cultural or ecological value. Um, but the crop rotation one is definitely, I think, the coolest because it really hits on, you know, something that we hear from farmers a lot, which is that, you know, that's great that you're buying one thing, but what about all the other things? Um, and so, uh, I think a great example of that is our organic seed crackers. So you mentioned sunflower, 
Um, that's a big ingredient that we use quite a bit of, um, specifically in that product. Uh, we use a lot of organic sunflower. Um, we have a direct trade program, which we can talk about a little bit too, if folks are interested. Um, but that product also contains pumpkin seed, um, sunflower seed, and flax, I believe. Mm -hmm. So trying to think through, you know, what are those different pieces that farmers might be adding to a rotation? And hopefully, you know, things beyond just corn and soy too, um, to kind of use that that full picture and understand the context beyond, you know, that one ingredient. I have so many follow-up questions to this little <laughs> nugget that you have here, but get us kicked off with chestnuts. I'm just dying of curiosity for how a very classic Midwestern tree um mm -hmm. is being used how that ingredient is being used in your products or how you're wanting it to be used as you are in diet mm -hmm. yeah so chestnut is an interesting one I think a lot of folks have heard of it maybe not always uh in like a packaged food product mm -hmm. um I personally had never eaten a lot of chestnuts um <laughs> until we were thinking you know about using it but it's currently in, we have an organic all-purpose mix. So we have chestnut in there. We also have uh, buckwheat and almond flour. Um, but we know that chestnut has really deep uh, root system and, you know, can uh, be very long-lived. So very long-lived perennial, you know, 100 plus years sometimes. But over, you know, the past decades has kind of been forgotten in terms of its use as a food source so um both you know in north america we had a big blight um that came yeah. through and kind of destroyed a lot of the chestnut um that was you know native to north america and even in you know europe and asia where there's other varieties of chestnut um you know, it was commonly consumed by an older generation and, you know, younger generations haven't really picked it up as much. Um, and so as a result of that, there's not a lot of demand left for chestnut, which is a shame because there's so many, you know, positive uh, outcomes of growing chestnut and, um, you know, supporting that crop. So it's also luckily when we think about you know, the R&D side of things, it's very naturally sweet. Um, and so it's a great addition to something like a baking mix where, you know, it helps us add less sugar. Um, so definitely a win-win, you know, for the planetary health side of things, but also human health side of things. So crackers, baking mix, things that you could imagine being very traditional and wheat-based, mm -hmm. or as you have just described, this sort of home for all of these different, very nuanced, very diverse crops. How do you stay true to the functionality um, of, you know, still needing to make a food product um, when you stick it in the oven and it still needs to taste good um, and trying to source all of these different crops in there? How does that, that marriage happen? Yes, it is definitely a marriage um, of a lot of different things. Um, we have an amazing R&D team, which definitely helps. Um, and we know too that, you know, taste is number one for most consumers. Um, while there are a, lot of, are a lot of folks, maybe like me, like you, who, you know, will buy that product just because of the story with it. And even if it doesn't taste great, I'll still buy it again. But the vast majority of um, consumers or eaters, as we like to call them, um, you know, taste is the most important thing hands down. And so for us, that means, you know, no matter how amazing, you know, the story is behind the product, if it doesn't taste great, people aren't going to buy it and let alone over and over again. And so we're not really going to have a, an impact at the end of the day, if folks don't actually want to buy that product. Um, so, you know, our innovation team understands that and, we definitely have no compromise when it comes to the taste of the product. Um, our R&D team, I think, has a really unique set of capabilities that has been built over the past few years to try a lot of interesting ingredients that they've probably never heard of 
Um, there's no book written about the functionality of these ingredients or, you know, how they work in a food product. Yeah. Um, so part of my role that I like to tell people is so fun is we do a lot of taste testing. Um, I, uh, really enjoy that element and I think honestly the R&D team does too like trialing a lot of really interesting things like chestnut you know like buckwheat um, when that's an ingredient that likely no one has ever used before in their home kitchen or you know in R&D job food company um, so I think you know that open mind when you know we bring up an ingredient that might seem odd at first but you know just trying it out and seeing you know how could we put it into a product does it you know hit all those kind of different needs that we're looking for um it's definitely creative and ongoing um yeah could you give me an anecdote about how you're in the field or one of your teammates are in the field and you discover one of these crops that you want to take to the r d do you have an example of that mm -hmm. I think buckwheat is actually a great example of that. Um, so we have buckwheat now in two products. We have our uh, mix that I mentioned, and then also we have a sandwich cookie, um, both delicious in case anyone is wondering. Um, and so, you know, through a lot of our conversations, not only, um, you know, with our direct trade program in Sunflower actually, but other kind of farmers that, you know, we, talk to and get input from um, kept hearing over and over again that we really want to grow buckwheat we want to grow it but no one's buying it like there's no demand for it um, I think you know folks had either like grown it through kind of a cover crop but not like for a cash crop purpose um, and so we thought okay that's really interesting is that something that we could use um, a lot of folks assume that buckwheat is a grain, but, you know, it's actually a seed. So we are a grain free company, but, you know, buckwheat, the name contains wheat. And so that can be kind of confusing uh, for eaters of our brand who are looking to be grain free. Um, and so our marketing team, that's another great example of how, you know, our marketing team has really gotten great at, you know, how do we communicate this kind of work to you know, folks who buy our products and the industry at large too. Um, but yeah, through that, we started experimenting with buckwheat thinking, you know, how do we use that in different items? Um, and so we found homes for it so far in two products um, and, you know, continuing to think, you know, how else could this come to life in a product? But it's been delicious so far. <laughs> yeah. So you've uh, yeah, at the opening, you mentioned grain free as well. And I realized that that might almost make uh, our group clutch their pearls <laughs> properly. Um, but uh, could you tell me, talk to me a little bit how, about, you still buy field crops. So we've got flax, we've got buckwheat, we've mm -hmm. got sunflowers. How, what is that distinction that you make between grain and seeds? Yeah, so for us, uh, grain is usually like, botanically a grass um so anything in that family we kind of consider grains um pseudo cereals like buckwheat uh that was a new um like space for us to go into um but you know I think when we think through like the impact of things like that how you know with buckwheat specifically you know people want to grow it there's so many benefits, you know, that they've recognized from being able to add that into their rotation um, that I think it was a great trial for us to like dip our toes into, you know, pseudo cereals and especially, you know, anticipating would consumers be really confused? Um, you know, how do we articulate the difference uh, between buckwheat and wheat for folks maybe who don't know about plant types have never thought about that before um but yeah I think it's a great example of how our teams have had to all kind of become very well versed in this space just by nature of working at Simple Mills regardless of you know their specific function um but yeah that's kind of how we look at at grains super 
That's really helpful. Well, we're glad to hear that things we grow are still in the bucket. Um, yes. We have a question in the chat for you from Hannah. And she's asking, when you're thinking about the this marriage again, do you start with a product that you want to fill with diverse ingredients? Or do you start with the, the ingredients and then make it into a product? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Um, I would say it's kind of both, like both happening in unison. And then when we find that like perfect marriage, so to say, um, that's like a hint that we're kind of in the right direction. Um, so because we have this commitment, um, you know, no product can just kind of come to market without this being kind of a core element of its existence. So um, we have, you know, a long list of really cool ingredients that we'd like to use at some point. Um, and so our R&D is kind of continuously thinking about like testing them out, you know, how would they function in a product so that when we're thinking about, you know, what is something that people really want? I think sandwich cookie with buckwheat is a great example where folks had been asking us for a sandwich cookie for years, like continuously saying, you know, I love Oreos, but I know that I shouldn't be eating, you know, 10 of those. Uh, can you make like a better version? Um, and so, you know, thinking through, okay, how do we make a sandwich cookie that is as nutritious as a cookie can be, you know, still tasting delicious and also including, you know, ingredients like buckwheat and coconut sugar. Um, and so a lot of times those kind of ideas are like many years, you know, in advance of when, you know, it'll come to light on the shelf or for, you know, an eater. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I think that's something too that um, externally, maybe people don't realize how many years, you know, we're thinking in advance and, um, you know, once we're experimenting with something like buckwheat, realizing, okay, how could that work in like the cookie shell of a sandwich cookie? Or how would that work in a baking mix? Um, let's test it out. Because sometimes really cool ingredients just aren't meant to be in like one of those categories, but they can be, you know, star heroes in another one. Um, so it's all about, you know, just finding that right fit. I love that. Do you think um, you have any sort of like general timeline for when you discover ingredient and when it becomes something on a shelf? I imagine, like you said, it takes a while. How long is a while? Um, it definitely depends. I feel like we say it depends as an answer to a lot of questions, but um, it depends on the crop, on you know the product that we're looking to use it in. Um, you know, I think with buckwheat, I would say it was like probably two to three years that we first kind mm. of thought like, oh, okay, what is buckwheat? People want to grow it. Let's learn about it. Um, and so, you know, especially too with, uh, crops that don't have a lot of commercial demand already, which is part of our goal in, you know, utilizing these ingredients is to help create like market demand for them um you know it's kind of a chicken or the egg scenario of okay if we want to use this but you know a supply system doesn't really exist for this at you know the scale that we would want to use it um you know being okay to kind of like develop that at the same time that we're developing the product um I think you know an example of that you know beyond buckwheat and chestnut um we are launching a really cool cracker this yeah. summer called Popham's. And within that, uh, including organic butternut squash and organic red bean. So red bean being, you know, a, a less commonly seen ingredient, especially in the United States. So, you know, we had to think about that far in advance of, you know, the month that we're launching this into the world, not only for, you know, the R&D team too, figure out how to use it, but also, you know, to make sure that we can uh, supply enough to support. I first saw this idea of the butter squash cracker um, mm -hmm. at the, at Expo West. And it was just yeah. one of those most mind blowing moments where the 
form of a food, I always associate squash to be something that you, you know, bake with brown sugar in the oven and it's a wet food um, <laughs> versus Emma, from my understanding, dehydrating it and then milling it into a flour and then using it in baking, which was just so cool. Mm -hmm. um, as you think about like future ingredients, um, what other foods do we think about just sort of, we don't give them enough potential consideration that we don't look at foods that could be made into these different functional groups like flowers or sorry, uh, cookies or flour mixes or mm -hmm. functional uh, uh, crackers. Um, what other foods are you excited about or other ingredients? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so many. I could probably talk about that for hours. Um, that's nice. definitely one of my favorite things is, you know, discovering really cool ingredients and learning a lot about them. Um, I think one group that we're going to see a lot of in the coming years, you know, even beyond like just thinking industry at large is legumes. So like beans and pulses. Um, I think we've just kind of scratched the surface, um, you know, as a natural food industry of the role that, uh, those kind of ingredients can play in products, not only, you know, for the planetary health benefits, uh, you know, the benefits of including that in a rotation, but on the human health side as well, you know, a lot of pulses and beans are loaded with protein and fiber. Um, and yeah, figuring out how to mill them into a flour is, you know, new, newer technology, definitely, um, you know, figuring out how to do that. But I think there's so many potential, you know, applications for those ingredients. Uh, in a lot of different products, you know, not only savory, but also sweet, depending on, you know, the kind of bean being used. So I think beans and pulses are a huge one. Um, I think beyond that, uh, lots of focus on perennial agriculture. So tree crops, um, especially kind of tree crops that have been uh, forgotten or, you know, just are not really prevalent uh, anymore. And even beyond that, like in the world of forgotten foods, I feel like we have really unlimited potential in terms of ingredients. Um, you know, when we think about like the ingredients that are in packaged food products today, it's really not that many crops actually. Right? Um, yeah. I know like, you know, corn, soy, wheat make up huge percentages of, you know, what is in the center of the grocery store today. and you know, our products are already a little bit differentiated from that in that we don't use corn, soy, or wheat, but even beyond, you know, those things that are really common in the food, like how do we go beyond that, um, you know, for the positive impacts of diversity, but also human health, um, you know, for us, we're really trying to capitalize on that place where uh, human health and ecosystem health intersect. Um, mm. And, you know, we know a lot of research supports the importance of, you know, our gut and our microbiome uh, being really critical to support that to eat a really diverse diet. Um, and so we're finding just so many places where what we know is good for, you know, an ecosystem, a farm is also really good for a human being what they should be eating. Um, so I think that's really exciting. That is, I think of every, you know, smart farm kid who wants to be a scientist, the reward and possibility of becoming this R and D person who reinvents <laughs> how we incorporate chestnuts into the food system. Wow. Uh, that is just an impact. That is really cool. Definitely. Um, do you know the story of, I guess, who are these chestnut farmers? <laughs> who are growing this crop and then sending it your way to become food. Yeah. How does so that work. Yeah. Um, I think that's another part that I love about my job is just getting to talk to a lot of different farmers, um, learn a lot about many different ingredients. Um, you know, I was not an expert in chestnut before I worked at Simple Mills, but you know, on the job, uh, learning about a lot of different crops. Um, with chestnut, um, right now, you know, 
using the European varietal just because, you know, the American varietal has been kind of decimated so much, but, um, you know, we've written, you know, letters of support and trying to support kind of grant work that is being done to revitalize the American chestnut. Um, you know, we know it was such a prevalent species before the blight kind of wiped it out. So thinking like, how do we support bringing back, you know, a native species like chestnut? Um, yeah. But yeah, chestnut is really interesting too, in that, you know, the supply system of what's available today is not really like commercial production. It's mostly, um, you know, like smaller land uh, holders, just like harvesting from, you know, a few trees that are there and then kind of aggregating that, um, which is quite different than a lot of other kind of uh, tree crops that are done in, you know, a conventional like orchard system. Totally. Yeah. Well, building on that, and you, you sort of already answered this question, but I want to expand on it a little bit. All of this R&D seems so useful to our entire food community. And I realize it's Simple Mills advantage to have it and to make all these products that are unique to Simple Mills. But how does that process of making a novel ingredient commercially available, uh, a supply chain that others can engage in. How how do you see that working and, and what sort of work are you doing to make that possible? So we see, you know, a regular marketplace of chestnuts or we see a robust mm -hmm. open sales of buckwheat. How are you thinking about that or, or making moves on that? Yeah, um, so we uh, have a phrase that Kaylin, our CEO, uses all the time, which is a rising tide lifts all boats. That's very much um, like a simple mills motto. Um, so, you know, a lot of times, yeah, if we're trying to use an ingredient that doesn't really have an established supply chain in place. There's a lot of work on our end that goes into helping support that, um, you know, making sure that uh, the processing, you know, is up to like standard and spec and, you know, getting everything ready to support um, like large volume of product. Um, but, you know, of course, after we have done that work, a lot of other folks can benefit from, you know, that ingredient being available, um, more available in a form that food companies would like to use. Um, and I think our view on it is that's great because, you know, even if Simple Mills can use a lot of cool ingredients, if we're the only one that does that, we're not going to change our food system at large. We need every food company to kind of start diversifying what they're using, being open to use different ingredients. Um, and so, you know, I think we're just happy to like create the opportunity not only to use it in our products but also for a lot of other companies to use it in their products um i think one great example of this is actually watermelon seed um that's another thing where people are like what is that watermelon seed um so we used watermelon seed we have a product called sweet thins which is kind of like a little graham style cookie um and watermelon seed flour is how we use it um since launching that product a few years ago have seen a lot of other um products use watermelon seed but just it being available for food companies to use as an ingredient um which definitely was not as much the case when we started to look into it um mm -hmm. And yeah, just to explain watermelon seed too, since people ask a lot of questions about that, um, it's it's a different uh, varietal than what we buy at the supermarket, you know, that's like very sweet flesh and like seeds that people are trying to get rid of. Um, but mm -hmm. this kind of watermelon is actually usually cultivated for the seeds. So the flesh is not very sweet. Um, the seeds as a result have a lot of really awesome nutritional benefits because most of the plant energy goes into putting that all in the seed, which then we're milling and, you know, using as a flower. Uh, so a lot of folks are really confused to find that, oh, there's actually other types of watermelon, you know, beyond the seedless variety that, you know, has been bred for grocery store shelves. 
That is fascinating. Do, and is that an American grown watermelon or where does that come from? So it comes from all over the world. There's many different regions that grow it. Um, we uh, actually had a direct contract that we worked with a farmer up in Canada. Um, we, we think as far as we know that that was the first time it was grown in North America. Um, let me know if anyone knows of other <laughs> folks growing a watermelon seed um but has is definitely a good example too of a forgotten crop that's been you know used historically in like local um uh, cuisine uh you know soups and stews um but you know hasn't really been brought beyond you know local dishes to like the international marketplace um yeah. so but it's such a nutrition powerhouse and uh, you know, has a lot of benefits on the ecosystem side. So just trying to, to bring it, bring it out into the world a little bit more. Love that. Um, Leia had a question in the chat. Um, you at Simple Mills have both organic and conventional products. Um, and where are you seeing the trend lines going? How do you see, you have a, a bunch of very specialty products, gluten-free, grain-free, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, a lot of value propositions for different eaters. Um, where does organic fit into that? And how are you seeing the R&D and the sales team and everyone looking at organics in the long run? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are definitely uh, unique in that we do both organic and not organic ingredients, but also products. Um, I would say at this point, you know, our organic products are doing really well. Consumers you know, ask for that. Lots of consumers, um, you know, care a lot about looking for organic now. Um, and so even beyond those certified organic ingredients or products, we use a lot of ingredients, even in products that are not, you know, fully certified. Um, so I think it's definitely uh, expanding from here. Um, you know, a lot of folks look for it and we know too, in terms of, you know, the ecosystem benefits that organic is just a great like baseline to start with when it comes to regenerative too. Um, you know, we think that regenerative can manifest in a lot of different systems, organic included. Um, and organic has a lot of those elements that we're really looking for, you know, that's kind of built in, so to say. Um, so, you know, especially too, in a lot of like, niche kind of uh, crops. Um, I think there's huge opportunity to expand the, you know, organic production of those um, and make them available to a lot more people. In this race to make these supply chains for these niche crops, would you say it's really sort of organics opportunity to invest in blowing up these uh, so that supply chains and just being mm -hmm. the option so that there's, if, you know, for watermelon seed, if it's just organic or we've done a lot of research mm -hmm. into organic, then that's going to be what we got. Um, yeah. Could you speak a little bit to how you, um, how you source from farmers? I think you mentioned that there's a special program with the sunflower seeds um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and how you're trying to create more direct relationships and buying patterns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So um, we have a direct trade program focused on organic sunflower in the Midwest of the U.S. Um, so they're working uh, with a cohort of farmers. Um, I heard that John Strophus was on a previous call. He was our um, guest last time. Yeah. yeah um, so with that program um, started a few years back now. Um, and Honestly, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I think a lot of food companies don't buy directly from farmers. And so we thought, like, how do we get creative? And, you know, what is the role that we need to play in terms of shifting that model, like away from a commodity system and towards one where, you know, one, we know the actual people growing the crop, but also that we're playing a role in, you know, spreading that risk. Um, creating incentives, uh, financial and non-financial, for farmers to 
do these kind of, you know, practice implementation that we're looking for and that consumers and eaters are starting to look for. Um, so through that program, you know, we've also learned to on, you know, from the marketing side and from our customers that, um, you know, learning where and who and how is growing your food is really motivating. People want to hear about that. They want to know who the people are behind, um, you know, what they're eating. And so direct trade and, you know, forging those really direct relationships with growers is a huge boon to, you know, not only helping us advance our goals in terms of, you know, regenerative agriculture, but also, uh, you know, satisfying an ask, a request that, you know, eaters are showing over and over again that they want to know more about where their food comes from. So the direct trade program has been an awesome way for us to really kind of dig deep there and, you know, understand what is the role for a brand to, to play in that space. Um, so with our contracts there, um, you know, helping spread the risk, um, we buy the planting seed, um, you know, trying to kind of take out some of that upfront risk, especially, um, you know, in the areas where we're doing this program, uh, several of the farmers had never grown sunflower before. So it's a new, uh, new crop. Um, you know, how do we make it, uh, how do we make that be a good opportunity to try something new and, um, you know, also include financial incentives that support you know, undertaking these kind of new, new practices. So, you know, with that too, I know you mentioned earlier, like not being prescriptive about, you know, telling farmers what to do. Um, we are very principle focused, not practice focused. So um, through that program, but also um, all of our uh, region ag work, it's very much, uh, we're not going to tell you like what specific practice you need to do it's up to each farmer to figure out like what works for them, what works in their own context. Um, so through the direct trade program with those um, kind of per acre payments, um, each you know, grower that's involved can tell us like what they wanted to do with it. You know, for some it's cover crop seed, for others it's fencing, you know, for livestock, uh, you know, compost application, whatever it is, um, we totally support you know, what's best for them to do at that moment, because I'm not a farmer, that's not my expertise. Um, and so, you know, we really want to recognize that and be open, you know, to supporting farmers in whatever way they need at that time. I don't want to undersell what you're saying right now, because I think it's pretty radically awesome. So your Symbol Mills is paying for the seed. I just wrote probably $25,000 of checks for seed. Very big mm -hmm. upfront bill in the springtime for farmers. So you're saying that Symbol Mills will pay for the seed and then also basically give a lump sum payment for good practices, be it what they may, that are going to help that particular mm -hmm. farmer. You got it right. Yep. <laughs> it's just... I wish every company could do that. That is really cool. So thanks to whoever came up with that. If it was you, <laughs> many props. Um, going back to a little bit to, um, well, when we were talking about organic versus conventional, mm -hmm. there was something you said that caught my ear um, that a lot of organic crops end up in conventional products. And in my head, that's just like, a you know, so sort of this amazing Trojan horse movement where we can get a lot more organic crops from the fields into food. And if it doesn't quite get to the point of the food being certifiable, we're still buying certified organic crops from certified organic farmers. Mm -hmm. How do you see, like, how do we get more folks to do that? How do we expand that? How do we lower that barrier to use more and more organic crops, diverse crops from organic farms across the whole country? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it comes back to, again, supply availability and creating, you know, reliable supply. Um, for a lot of food companies, it's not only ensuring that there is supply, but that there's, you know, reliable supply. So we need a lot of folks like growing those ingredients, um, you know, to ensure that there's enough, you know, not only to 
create yeah. a product at the start, but also hopefully a product that does well and grows over time and increases the amount of those ingredients. Um, and I totally agree, you know, this like Trojan horse, there's a lot of in organic ingredients in products that aren't 100% organic, um, which I think that's still worth celebrating. And, you know, yeah. that's still amazing that the demand is there, but also that, you know, more organic ingredients are going into mouths and bodies and, um, you know, it doesn't always have to be a hundred percent um for it to be a positive thing. Absolutely. Um we had a question in the chat. Do you have any one pager or landing page for this um uh direct trade program, this farmer uh support and the risk management? Risk mitigation? So we don't have a specific web page, but on our website we have um a link to our People and Planet Impact Journal, which is our kind of first foray into really explaining all the work that we've been doing. Um, and there is some information about direct trade within that uh, journal. So that's just available on our website. Um, and if you're interested in growing Sunflower or working with Simple Mills, I think Nate can probably send out my email. Feel free to send me a note. Awesome. We have a question from Michael O'Donnell. Michael, do you want to go and unmic? Unmute, sorry. Mic up. <laughs> there, can you hear me? We can. Mm -hmm. Please go ahead. All right. I would type. I would type it in the chat, but I'm driving, so I'm trying to be safe. All good. Um, yeah. The the questions around like supply and risk risk mitigation, risk management are are interesting to me. Anytime we're talking about um, you know diversification, more niche crops. Um, particularly on the organic side. I mean, it, I guess it doesn't matter to be organic or conventional, but, um, you know, I work with a farm that uh, going into a second year of raising a, a pretty niche crop that's not really grown, um, you know, so the, a lot of unknowns, a lot of risk there. Uh, it's for a small snack food company. Um, and they actually have like in the contract a floor price that they pay regardless of production because you can't insure the crop. Um, there's not going to be any feed market if you don't need food grade spec. Um, so essentially in order for them to get a supply, try to guarantee a supply, they're essentially guaranteeing some kind of payment to the growers to create that supply, right? Um, obviously that could end up challenging financially if everybody has a crop failure, but it is a unique setup that one company is, is pursuing. But I think more broadly, I mean, the challenge we come back to is, like you said, it's like chicken and egg. We've got the established commodity crops, whether that's conventional or organic, you know, on the organic side, the big thing driving demand for field crop acres isn't necessarily the food industry, it's, it's feed, right? It's poultry and dairy. And even on the organic side, that's become very commodified and that most rations are corn and soybean based. And it's like, uh, so it's e I think it's easy then to think about, okay, I wanna grow some food grade corn, some food grade beans, because if I don't meet spec, there's always the, the, the feed market. And so when we start stepping into these more diverse crops, like whether it's buckwheat or sunflower or uh, whatever, it's like, well, there may not be a feed user for this and I can't get it insured. So two things that become risk mitigation for the main quote unquote commodity crops are gone. Yeah. Um, so, so again, I know you already talked about some of the, the risk things, the financial pieces you're taking on with the growers you work with. I'm just throwing it out there generally for the group to consider and that it continues to be a challenge to support these more diverse crops uh, on the food grade side. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. That, Michael. So many so, good go points. Um, yeah, I agree with everything you said. Um, there's so many challenges and like one brand, you know, that's really awesome that, uh, you know, they have a floor and the contract is set up that way. I think that's a huge opportunity for a lot of food companies that are going to be working directly with farmers is, you know, getting in place multi-year contracts that have that kind of floor and ceiling. Cause 
we've also heard, you know, that, you know, that stability is really valuable and ends up working out most of the time for both parties involved. Um, just because there's not going to be, you know, wild swings in what's happening. Um, but too, with, you know, just trying to get more exposure for a lot of those crops, um, because hopefully we get to a point where, you know, if it doesn't meet one spec, you know, it's still, there's still other places for it to go. Um, so I think, you know, of course, that's like a much bigger issue than any one company, but the more we can, you know, get these kind of ingredients into more food products and get you know eaters to a point where maybe that is sold as an ingredient in the store um beyond just being included in a product too um there's a lot of opportunity to create you know that that safety net so to say it sounds like we need a nice robust conference where we all have a race to figure out how to incorporate <laughs> these ingredients into 30 different things to make more options well, and, and, and there's no reason and there's no reason poultry feeders can't be putting buckwheat and sunflower kernels totally yes I, they uh, uh, and flax and everything i know it's it's more expensive that's that's kind of the rub and it doesn't easily fit and you've got a nice ration that's working and provides guaranteed productivity from those birds it's, it's easy to just follow that formula yeah mm -hmm. and that's a great point well, Berkeley, thank you so much for joining us today. Again, I realize it's early your time, but this is such a fun conversation. I wish we had more time. I think yeah. that this, you know, high level, how do we talk about things that are outside our regular comfort zone as far as ingredients, but have so much potential to make a more nuanced, more interesting, and hopefully more beneficial food system. So really appreciate your insights and the work you're doing at Simple Mills. Thank you. Well, and folks, that is mostly the wrap. We have um, a few things to uh, to touch on. We've got the organic advisor um, listserv, as we mentioned before, and the organic agronomy field crop course is also live. So please go to um, our website and we are going to do this next month and we're going to see you all later. So again, thank you so much, Berkeley. Hope you get some uh, some time before you have to start your date and really appreciate you joining us again and hopefully we'll see you soon. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. All right, everybody. Thank you. Take care.